Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this Thursday, January 5th, 2023 in the Locker Room. I'm Alan Locker. Emmy Award-winning director and musician Fredo Xavier is here to celebrate his incredible 25-year career directing some of your favorite daytime dramas. He began his career on Guiding Light under his original name, Scott Riggs, as an intern, then worked as a production associate, associate director, writer, and director. In New York City, he spent time directing on Another World, One Life to Live, As the World Turns, and All My Children before relocating to Los Angeles to direct Sunset Beach, MTV's Spider Games, Passions, Days of Our Lives, The Young and the Restless, and ultimately, ultimately General Hospital, where he currently resides. Fredo has also written two songs for General Hospital's Nurses Ball, which were performed on the show by Eden McCoy. He also made an on-camera appearance singing an original song on GH. It is my pleasure to welcome Emmy Award winner Fredo Xavier to the locker room. Hey, Fredo. Hello, Alan. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much for being here, and congratulations on 25 years. Thank you. Thank you. When you hear 25 years, you know, what, what comes to your mind? What pops in? Well, how my, how time flies. <laughs> I mean, does. when you think about it, it's, it's been 20, I've been directing for 25 years, but as you know, I, I, I started in other capacities. I mean, and I met you certainly early on. I don't know if we want to go into how many years ago it was, but you know, I, I remember you in the in the production offices at Guiding Light. So we, we've yeah. known each other for decades. many years. Decades. decades. Yeah. <laughs> and share a mutual love of the genre. Absolutely. Speaking of, of that love, where did it begin for you? Well, I was home uh, in 10th grade and all my friends were in 12th grade. And it was during the summer and they all had to get summer jobs to uh, prepare for college. And I didn't have to get a summer job. And I would uh, work on music. I, was, I had a tape recorder and I was doing all kinds of things. And one day I wanted to watch TV at four o'clock. Now I, I used to, you know, I like to watch the sitcoms in the morning and then there was the dead zone between one o'clock and four o'clock where there was nothing on but soap operas, which I avoided like the plague. And I wanted to watch Planet of the Apes at four o'clock on the four o'clock movie. And I turned on channel four at 10 of four and I watched the last 10 minutes of Another World and there was Ray Liotta and he was being dragged into the back of a van by this girl who was trying to set it up so that his girlfriend who was gonna be walking down the path any minute would see them in the back of the van making out. And so uh, I watched that and I was like, oh, that was weird. Watch Planet of the Apes. And then the next day I thought, I wonder what that's happening on that, what happened with that girl in the van. And I watched Another World that day. And she, of course, the girl, the girlfriend went running to see her brother in the stables to t tell him about how Joey was cheating on her. And uh, the, the noteworthy thing about that was the guy who was playing her brother in the stables was Gary Tomlin, who was a, a oh, famous wow. yeah. writer, executive producer, actor, director of daytime. But the other significant thing is that there was a character on the show called Iris, played by Beverly McKinsey. And she, I was, looked at her and watched her performance and I was so mesmerized by her. And she had this maid um, named Vivian and they were like this weird mismatched comedy duo. And I just fell in love with the show. Now, I, I should also tell you that the show was 90 minutes long at the time. So I watched it that day, did not watch it the next day and then wondered what happened. And I tuned in on the fourth day and I was like, I had missed something and I didn't want to miss anything. So that summer, I devoted myself to another world and watched it every day. Wow. So another world was your introduction. Um, and then yeah. you ended up as an intern first at Guiding Light. Actually, first in another world. Oh, you did? Yeah. I My father worked for um, General Electric and they had a connection to NBC. And so I... 
asked him to find a way to get me into production at NBC. And I proposed myself as an intern and they, uh, and, and I ended up going through NBC and getting an opportunity at the studio where Another World was produced, but they had never had an intern before. I was their first intern and the producer, Kathy Chambers, used to joke with me or joke with other people. And she would say, he's our intern, but he doesn't realize this isn't a hospital. So that was how new the concept of a student intern was. And then a year later, the show that I had also really loved, which was an Another World spinoff called Texas, had been canceled. And I was a viewer of the shows, but I really loved to watch the credits. So I was, I was a fan of the executive producer, Gail Kobe. And she went on to produce Guiding Light right after Texas was canceled. And I started watching Guiding Light to see what changes she might bring to the show. And at that point, I saw a little notice at NYU, which is where I went to school, that Guiding Light needed an intern. And even though I had already done an internship in Another World, I applied for that internship and uh, was luckily uh, invited to come up and interview. And I got the internship. And from there, you know, try to insinuate myself in, into the good graces of, of the Guiding Light Productions staff. Uh, I bet you did. Hey, Fidel, you are frozen on our end. So I'm just going to kick you off. Just sign back in and it should work no problem. Because we, you. You we can hear you perfectly, but your, your face is frozen. Okay. So he'll be right back. Yeah, we can hear him, but we but we can't see him. But um, oh my God, the stories that he must have. He has been doing this a long time. I hope everybody is having a great week. Um, happy New Year to everybody, and uh, Fido will be right back, as they say. Don't go anywhere. Here he is. Let's try that again. There you are. Perfect. Um, what do you think you learned as an intern at both shows? Well, in the first show, I was following the crew and I was, I had to be there when they set up the sets and when they struck the sets and I looked at lighting, I watched everything that went on to, to put the studio together. And I learned about the, the staffing of the crew, but I, they gave me a, a run of the studio. So I would hang out in the makeup room. I remember I mean, I must have been very annoying to some of the actors, but uh, I would sit in the makeup room and talk to them and I, I would stand on the floor. I remember watching Nancy Frangione as Cecile and, and Constance Ford as Ada and of course, uh, Victoria Wyndham and Irene Daly as Aunt Liz. And, and, uh, and, I, and, the, and the directors had this podium that they would move around and they would, they would do the camera blocking. So I saw the, how the multiple cameras worked Sometimes they let me sit in the control room. I just saw the way they put it together. And I was interested in, in the whole idea. Now, I had watched a, a TV show from England called I, Claudius, which was a masterpiece theater thing that was 13 parts. And it was like a serial. And it was the first continuing serialized story that was shot all in the studio I had ever seen. And I loved the look of it. And I, and I, I liked the video look of soap opera. And so I remember one thing on Another World that, that kind of upset me was they taped a scene and the show was long and so the scene never aired. And I was like, what? There are scenes that never air on the soap opera? So that was a little shocking. But um, yeah, I mean, it, and, 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 you know, so, and then going to Guiding Light, I was in the production office. So I had to learn about script revisions and, and, and the protocols of, how you send the, the, the different things to, to the actors and the directors and, and the importance of what was taping that day in the booth was the most important thing. You know, just there was this protocol of going back, you know. I mean, there, there were days when CBS would call us up and say there was a problem with the air show that day and we'd, we'd have to call to get the show back and quickly re-edit something. And, you know, so everything was, was on a, a knife's edge. I think we were two weeks ahead of air for Guiding Light. We're now five oh, weeks man. ahead of air for General Hospital. And we wow. were five to six weeks ahead of air on Passions because we had so much special effects to put in. 
Hmm. Alex Johnson and Jalori Hurst are watching right now. I love <laughs> Alex Johnson and I love Jill Lori Hurst. I used to annoy her in her office, Jill. And I think I annoyed Alex as well, but I do love Alex. I, I, I'm, I hope in her heart she is, has fond memories of me. <laughs> well, you, you, you made me smile when you were talking about the makeup room because, you know, when I was a fan and doing, you know, things for the fan club, that makeup room was the best place, you know, for a fan to hang out ever, you know. And then, you know, when I worked on the show, best, best room in the house. It's like the yeah. kitchen at a party, right? It's uh, like a, absolutely. It's like a kitchen absolutely. at a party. Absolutely. So what, you know, uh, having access to the set, was directing always on your radar? No, I, I, I really had no ambitions at all. I just wanted to be there. Um, I kind of thought producing would be fun. I thought directing was too um, much of a, of a leadership type A personality thing. I thought writing would be better for me because I was a shy person. And so I pursued writing and uh, the executive producer, Joe Wilmore, he gave me my opportunity to write on Guiding Light. And I, I wrote under Pam Long and I was part of the writer development program. And for six months, I, I was writing scripts and outlines. I later sent one of those scripts or maybe an outline to, um, Gosh, I can't remember her name. She was she was an actress who later was a head writer of Loving. But anyway, she wrote back a letter saying, you have no dramatic sense whatsoever. I will never hire you as a writer. <laughs> that was possibly a, a clue. So oh, no. once my writing opportunity ended, one of the directors, <laughs> Bruce Barry, he took me uh, aside because I was a production assistant. So I was I was in the booth. And I was, I was someone who was, you know, the directors knew I had to work very closely with them. And he said that I should consider becoming an associate director. And I liked that idea because that was the position that did the editing. And I really yeah. loved editing. Editing was, was very much musical, a lot about rhythm. And I liked putting things together. So I then pursued becoming an associate director and uh, Robert Calhoun, the executive producer, he gave me my full-time job as an associate director. And um, that was, re I learned so much under that. Uh, if I knew now what I, if I knew then what I know now, I might never have become a director because <laughs> of the uh, pressure that the director's under. But um, yeah. as an AD, it was, you know, you had to, you had to put the show to bed. You had to take the day's taping and, you know, gussy it up and m make sure it was all shined and polished and perfectly uh, good. And, 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 and we used to do it on tape. So you would have to, you know, you'd line up one tape with the second tape and then you'd have to find the, the in position and you'd just lay it down from the beginning of the show, from prologue to the closing credits. Now they do it in a nonlinear method and, and that's a lot easier and you can be a lot more creative. And I left Guiding Light actually to go to One Life to Live because they were the first show in New York that was doing nonlinear editing on a computer. And I really wanted to participate in that. So even though Guiding Light was giving me an opportunity to direct, I went to One Life to Live because I, I thought it would be more uh, enjoyable to work on nonlinear editing. Gotcha. Before I forget, Alex said, absolutely. Jill said, hi, turn up. And Jill said, Malie Taggart. That's, that that's, <laughs> she's the one who told me I, 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 I yeah. don't quit your day job. Do you remember anything you wrote specifically under Pam? Yeah, that I remember there were some scenes where Rusty and uh, Alex Neal, who played a character called Rose. Gosh, I can't Rose. Rose. Yeah, they, they were like on the on the run and, and they were uh, doing some kind of like um, uh, karaoke with each other in, in this uh, in, in this, you know, uh, safe house. I loved Alex Neal because she was on Texas and she played Ruby. And that was one of my very favorite characters. In fact, I stole Ruby's purse from the floor 
of Texas when I was an intern on Another World because it was left behind like in a crevice somewhere. And I was like, what is this? And I opened it up and it had Alex Neal's script in it. And I realized it was Ruby Wright's purse. So I have Ruby Wright's purse if, if the um, Procter & Gamble is looking for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're coming for you. You told me that everything you know about directing, you learned from the amazing team at Guiding Light, especially Bruce yeah. Barry, with honorable mentions from Scott McKinsey, Joanne Sedwick, and Irene Pace. So my question is, can you possibly articulate what you think you learned from each one of them? Yes. Well, from Bruce, I learned how to be a workhorse and how to get a show done and get it done quickly and unite a cast. Like he just brought everyone in. There was no problem too great for him to solve. He made it look so easy. And I know it wasn't because they gave him crazy shows. And he just, he, he had his book he came in the morning, he, he went through it. Um, he, he, he was uh, a very, I would say his directing took some risks in certain places, but he kept things simple so that he had room to, to uh, explore on the day and to create as he went. Joanne Sedwick had the neatest handwriting I've ever seen. You could tell that by the time she wrote her script down, she knew exactly what she was doing. Never can I remember in my years of working on Guiding Light, did she ever change a shot or did anything ever turn out differently from what she intended, unless there were rewrites or, or a character was removed from the scene. But she, and, and she had her stature, she had posture that was, Amazing, and you followed her in uh, out onto the floor like she was, you know, a drill sergeant. And and she also was very creative. I mean, all the directors were very creative. So so don't get me wrong in thinking mm -hmm. that someone was you know pedestrian. But Joanne, she could set things up. She was an AD. She knew what the AD needed. She like sort of Alfred Hitchcock, who used to you know he would just only give the edit exactly what he wanted them to see. Joanne shot a very clean show and she was extremely concise and she, you know, she, she comes from a daytime dynasty. You know, she, her father was John Sedwick who directed Edge of Night, Dark Shadows, Santa Barbara. Her, her sister still works on The Bold and the Beautiful. You know, her other sister, Carol, was, was a director, I mean, was an associate director on As the World Turns. Mm -hmm. She's got, uh, you know, uh, I mean, her family's, Deep in the business, her mother played Dr. Sedgwick on uh, yeah. Guiding Light. Um, so, and then you go to Irene Pace. Now, Irene was like chaos manifested like a Tasmanian devil. She, <laughs> she was always following something. She would write her show down. She would write her script down. And, and my job in the morning was to copy the director's script and then give it back to them. And when we would go to dress rehearse, she would, you know, it was very important that we keep, my job was to keep the cameras aware of what their next shot was. And if we dropped a shot, I had to know what was the next shot we were likely to pick it up on and let both the technical director and the cameras know where we were coming. We did not have shot numbers on Guiding Light. We just had shot descriptions. So I had to kind of speak in a headset about w what the shots were. And Irene would drop shots and she would suddenly go to a different camera and she would be narrating to the camera what she wanted them to do while we were rehearsing. And then it would mean that, that all these different shots had been dropped, but I knew that there was a moment coming up that needed to be a close-up of, you know, of, of, of like Alexandra or something. And I'd be, I would figure out which camera was free and be like, camera three, give me the close-up. <laughs> and so then they would, you know, and then she would find her way back from the path that she went down. And the, the protocol was always that we would go out to give notes after the dress rehearsal. So she would leave the, stu the, the control room and rush out to the floor to give notes. And I would have to follow her with, with um, or actually that was what a PA did. As an AD, my job was to try to figure out what we were gonna do in taping. But if I asked her, she would yell at me. So I knew not to ask her what we were doing. And I would just tell the cameraman like, just stay with it. 
We're going to see what happens. And we would go through it. And it was one of the greatest learning curves ever um, because her shows were beautiful. She found things on the fly. Her shows always came together beautifully. The, the executive producers loved them. She did gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And uh, she was, it was like, you know, schizophrenia. Um, and then Scott McKenzie, he was a very precise, he came from editing. So he also had a, a precision about him. Him, He, he was very interested in, uh, in like cinematic, fi filmic. I mean, he would, his shot descriptions would be like paragraphs long. And when we were ADs, we had to narrate the shots to the camera people. And Scott really wanted us to try to say his entire verbiage, but that didn't often happen. So I learned how to really try to crystallize what the intent of the shot was. And, you know, like, follow Amanda as she picks up the knife, tilt down when she, you know, reaches for the, the, the book, you know, like, and, 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 you know, and truck left. So there were, there, you know, there were a lot. And then of course I, I learned from Scott when I observed him, when I was a director with him on uh, general hospital as well. Absolutely. When you look back, guiding light was the first soap that actually paid you because as an internet, in other world, you know, you weren't. When you look back on just the whole Guiding Light experience, what, you know, what comes to mind for you? Well, I was there for 11 years. So they were on the air for 70 years. I mean, radio and TV. So that's a pretty big chunk of change, you know. Um, I, I think it's weird, the genre that we work in and the genre that we watch and live in, because they're like communities of people. I could probably tell you more about what happened to Reva Shane than I could tell you about what happened to my brother or sister, you know, in the ins and outs of their life. I know more about Springfield and, you know, the characters and the families and the who, who's who. Uh, so I, I felt like I was part of this community. Now, at the same time, it was a it was a job and it was a, sh a show. But the cliche about the, sh the shows we work on is that they're like families. They're like dysfunctional families, but they're like families. So when I look back on Guiding Light, I think of the two places that we worked, the two crews that we had. We were on 26th Street in a, a CBS uh, a adjacent studio. We had a CBS crew. And then we moved to Screen Gems EUE near the UN on 44th Street, which was a it was an independent studio, so we couldn't take our CBS crew with us. And we ended up inheriting the Screen Gems EUE crew, which had been the same crew, many of the same people from Edge of Night and Search for Tomorrow, which had both been in that studio. So, uh, and in both places, you know, um, we, we formed a bond. I mean, I was there through a lot of different executive producer regimes. I came under, I came under Gail Kobe. I was there under Joe Wilmore, then Robert Calhoun, then Jill Phelps, and then um, Michael Labson. And there were so many PAs and ex associate producers and directors and, and cast, writers. I mean, I, I, my, one of my jobs was to communicate with a lot with the writers, um, but, but there was always Betty Ray, our beautiful, wonderful casting director. Um, so what's my, my memory? My memory is like, you know, I'm a Springfield boy. I came from Springfield, USA, <laughs> even though I, I, you know, used to send postcards to Bay City. You know, <laughs> I, I came out of college and relocated to Springfield. Then I briefly went to Landview. Yeah. I, I, you know, Landview was nice, but I, I came out to California for Sunset Beach, which was, I'd stayed for a little while, but then I ultimately went to Harmony in, in the, uh, you know, the Northeast. And then now I'm on uh, I'm on in, in Port Charles, back in New York, back in New York with stops to Genoa City and Pine Valley and you know all the beautiful places Salem. Yeah. Of course. You you also mentioned uh, Gary Tomlin and the late Bill Glenn as mentors. Can you share a little of what you think you learned from each of them? Bill Glenn was like a eight foot tall giant, and he is the one who created the Young and the Restless look. That beautiful look where you can't, you know, coming across crystal and foreground stuff and gorgeous lighting. And he would like, he, he, he got Erica Slezak to, to face the wall in a corner and do a monologue during a, a therapy session. I mean, he could, he could charm actors 
to doing anything. And he had one of the most beautiful visual senses as well. He was also someone who, who just wanted what he wanted. He, he would get, you know, he, he, he cared deeply about the visual nature of the show. Um, Gary Tomlin came up through the ranks. He was an actor. He then became a writer, I think, first, or maybe he became a director first. No, I think he became a writer first. And then he became a director. I mean, he was writing on Guiding Light. He wrote every show there ever was, was a producer on uh, One Life to, on uh, Another World. I mean, All My Children. They became executive producer of, of, of um, Sunset Beach, directed Another World, One Life to Live, All My Children. Um, he, he taught me that it wasn't about me. It wasn't about my directing. It was about the story and the audience and that the story was the most important thing. And my job as a director was to serve the story. Yes, you might add a little style. His, his recipe was that you take one set in a day and maybe you focus on zhuzhing it up. You, 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 maybe you care deeply about some visual thing in a, a show because he has a beautiful visual eye and, and, and does a lot, has a lot of great ideas. But he also taught me, keep it simple, stupid. You know, we move quickly. We want. We don't want to fatigue the crew. We don't want to fatigue the actors. We don't want to spend the money unwisely. We want to put the money on, on the screen. And what the audience cares about is the characters. I care about the close-up of Rachel Corey when Iris has just told her, you know, that Mac is seeing Janice. You know, that's what I care about. I don't care about, you know, the frou-frou. Now, Bill Glenn... He cared about the frou-frou. And I got to say, when you turn on The Young and the Restless and that you know, the camera goes around the crystal and it slowly zooms into Ashley talking to Nikki, you, you, you're you like, ooh, you feel like a spy. You feel like you're like, wow, what am I watching? Ooh, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm going to hide behind this crystal, you know, decanter and spy on Ashley and Vic, Nikki for a while. So... Yeah, that is incredible what you what you've witnessed and been a part of. You know, we were talking before we went live. What are some of the talk about some of the biggest changes to the way, you know, you started directing to the way they're directing today? Well, when I started, it was one show a day. You know, we, we had maybe Christmas off. We had the Thanksgiving weekend. We maybe had a week at Christmas, but we were doing the shows. Guiding Light had two studios. One Life to Live had one studio. Um, so we, we could, at Guiding Light, they would do these, these really high concept things. Like they had this storyline about the dreaming death and they had this compound, Zamana's compound, because Fletcher and I think uh, Claire uh, went to some you know, country to try to find the cure for the dreaming death. And they did all the dreaming death scenes in the, in the smaller upstairs studio and they had a second director shooting that while downstairs in our main studio i think we had studio 52 and studio 54 which weirdly enough is the same numbers as the studios out in general hospital where poor charles and gh shot but um so we had our two studios and we could do multiple things and we they would do a lot of pre and post tapes but you generally would get your five shows done within a week. Now that was also the era when they went on location a lot. So you would, they would write way in advance these location things and then send people to Barbados or, or uh, Switzerland or wherever. I mean, really now Bold and Beautiful is the only show that, that goes away like that. And they do that primarily because they have huge audiences in some of those countries. Okay. And, yeah. and they are, are syndicated around the world. So it, it brings goodwill. It's a goodwill ambassadorship. We, we only pretty much air at this point in the US and Canada. So it doesn't behoove us to necessarily go away. Plus our show is a little more contained. So nowadays, now that, that method, uh, a, a show a week, I mean, a show, you know, five shows in, in five days was the way it worked. And that was at a time when soap operas had huge audiences. We, we were, you know, there were only networks and maybe cable TV. There wasn't streaming. There wasn't video games. There weren't VCRs. There weren't, I mean, VCRs were coming into existence. 
there wasn't like DVDs and a lot of home tapes. You, you know, flash forward now where the audience is so wildly diverse in terms of what they can watch, so many different ways to watch shows. We get a very small audience. We have a very loyal audience. We get but a very small audience. So this the network, you know, what I call the great purge of, of 20, you know, 2007 to 2010 when we lost Poor Charles, Passions, uh, uh, One Life to I Live, mean, heard, Another World, I mean, As the World Turns, Guiding Light, and All My Children. Once that happened, then then when, when the ABC said, um, you got to do this pretty cheaply, they meant business. And one of the things that Frank uh, Valentini at, at General Hospital, when he came from One Life to Live, he brought this concept of, of walkaways where we would, they would write so that we would have fewer set changes and they could keep the sets up longer, which would enable us to shoot a more, a wider variety of, of, of things. And we were able to then get to this method that they had begun in New York under either Gary or, or Frank, where we would do 15 shows in 10 days. And then when you do 15 shows in 10 days, that means your third week, you're dark and you don't pay the crew for that third week. So now our schedule at General Hospital is that we basically work 36 weeks and we have uh, 13 weeks or 16 weeks off. So, so we, don't, um, we don't produce during those weeks. They, they're, they're spending time in post-production on those weeks. So we work very quickly. We have multiple directors. When I started, it was one director a day, unless you had two studios running simultaneously which we sometimes did at Passions, and we sometimes did, we certainly did at Guiding Light. Um, you know, uh, General Hospital has one studio, so we could never do that. But now, under under Frank, we have all the directors could be working, you know, two or three or four days in a, in a week to, to work on their show. And I think it was The Young and the Restless that really started the process years ago of having directors follow their exact show. So if, if there was a scene being done on you know Thursday from Wednesday show, that director would return and direct that scene, so they could keep that that continuity of director authorship. And I have mm. to admit, I certainly love being able to direct my whole show. I it, it can be uh, tiring to come in that many days because it's a it's a lot of um, pedal to the metal. But I do. I mean, I, I'm addicted to this work. I, I love I love the cast. I love the crew. I love devise. I love figuring out how to put something on its feet and, and the collaboration, like an actor might say, Oh, I have this idea that I want to do this thing. I mean, Fanola Hughes, I was doing some scenes with her and James Patrick Stewart the other day. And she said, Fido, what would happen if I leapt over the sofa and, and like nestled in his arms, like he was asleep on a couch and she wanted to sort of jump over the sofa into his arms. I'm like, ah, works for me. It'll only make me look, a lot better as a director, <laughs> and you know, so you just you get to you get to really um, you know put something put something bring something to life, and that's where you know I feel kind of like it's weird to have this job where my 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 entire uh, employment history is that I've been working in this fantasy world, helping you know put this fantasy up on its legs so that audiences can like come to Port Charles you know, yeah. with me and see, you know, what Laura's going to do. A ab absolutely. And, you, you know, you just mentioned Fanola and James Patrick, but you've worked with, you know, legends, Beverly McKinsey, Jeannie Cooper, Erica Slezak, Juliet Mills, Leslie Ann Down, David Canary, Ben Masters, Eric Braden, Tony Geary, Susan Lucci, Kim Zimmer. Um, you know, share some memories that pop into your head uh, of some of these folks. Well, you know, when I started on General Hospital, Jeannie Francis was not on the show regularly. Now, the first soap opera magazine I ever bought was Soap Opera Digest with Jeannie Francis and Ken Schreiner on the cover. And I did not watch General Hospital, but I have to admit having a little bit of envy because anytime I would see it, I would see Jeannie Francis and, and Ken or Jeannie and Tony or Jeannie and, and, and um, Bobby and they just looked so glamorous and amazing. So what the first opportunity that I got to work with Jeannie Francis on General Hospital, and I think she was, 
comatose or just coming out of her coma at the time. <laughs> that was a thrill. She was still in Shady Brook and Lulu went to visit her and I got to work with her and um, it, it was amazing. I mean, you know, the people you mentioned, David Canary, uh, Susan Lucci. I, I got to work with Susan after working with her daughter. So Eliza on passion. So it was nice to be able to sort of have an in, you know, to be able to yeah. say hello. Now the, the, the three, the three people that I first watched and loved were Beverly McKenzie, Victoria Wyndham, and Kim Zimmer on the doctors. Because as you know, when you start one soap opera, <laughs> very often you end up watching all the shows on that network. So right. I was an NBC guy and I was a fan of the doctors and days of our lives and another world. And then later Texas. So working with Beverly, you know, Beverly was not on another world was when I was an intern, but Victoria Wyndham was, but I then went to guiding light and Beverly was on as uh, the Baroness Alexander von Halkine. <laughs> and I got to observe her and I never got to direct her, but you know, she was just the greatest. Uh, Chris Bruno, her brother. I remember one day I um, asked the actors or, or the actors were, there was like a wedding and nobody could get out for lunch. And I, I asked Chris Bruno if he wanted something for, you know, I, I was going to go to a store and get something. And I, I was like, do you want anything? And I, I brought him something back. And the next day he brought an apple and he put an apple on my desk. So I was like, I just got an apple on my desk from Chris Bruno, you know, things like that, that were so exciting. But then also, coming to Guiding Light and seeing Kim Zimmer come on the show. That was like, oh my God, they got Kim's, they got Beverly McKenzie and Kim Zimmer and Harley Kozak on Guiding Light, you know, because she was on Texas, which was yeah. my favorite show. And watching how Pam subtly changed Guiding Light from what it was in the Quintanola years under Marland you know, and then she brought it into the Riva years, the, the, the Pam Long era. Um, so now the first day I ever worked on Another World as a director, I had Victoria Wyndham. And I was sharing the day with Michael Eilbaum, who was the director of record on that day. My name was not on the paperwork. I had made the mistake of not kind of going and schmoozing with people ahead of time to let them know that a new director was coming. So I'm, I'm sitting in the control room. I mean, sitting in the rehearsal hall and there was a long hall down before you got to the rehearsal hall, but coming down the hall is Victoria Wyndham and she's holding her script like this. And she comes into the room and Michael, I, and she's looking at Michael Adam and he says, I, I'm not directing you today. He is. And he points to me and she looks at me and she says, I don't know who you are, but whatever, whatever you think we're doing, I'm not going to say, <laughs> these words on this script and just, and i'm like that's perfectly okay let's see what let's see what's going to happen my name you know i introduced myself we sat down it was a scene with her and i think her daughter maggie or her granddaughter i don't know it, maggie was cecile and 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 um chris rich sandy's daughter and so she was max granddaughter and so rachel i guess had a relationship with her so she was it was before Amanda, uh, Maggie was going to have a wedding or so. I don't even remember what the storyline was, but that, that was my first meeting of Victoria Wyndham. And then later on, a, a day or two later, I, I, when I, when I went back and worked again, I, I, I was working with her and I, I went up to her and I said, listen, Victoria, I, I'm sorry to do this, but I have to tell you that I'm a big fan. You were the first person I ever watched on a soap opera when you and Janice frame were battling each other in the pool and you stabbed Janice in the pool. And I said that those scenes were so beautiful. And, and she kind of begrudgingly looked at me like, well, I, okay, I guess you're okay. And so, you know, <laughs> I, I did, I, I won over Victoria Wyndham and, and she was wonderful. I love her. I loved working with her, but yeah, I mean, gosh, Eric Braden, Jeannie Cooper, uh, Leslie Ann Down, Juliet Mills, you know, I mean, I, I specifically asked you, to use the picture of me with Juliet Mills because she's like my spirit animal. She <laughs> is, 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 is the, the, the joy of my life. Working with her as Tabitha on passions was, I mean, and she had to learn pages 
pages of monologues where she would narrate what was happening with the other characters on the show and then be talking to Timmy or a doll or to you know some disembodied head in a jar or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, and, and then you, you have the special guest stars that come on working with Donna Mills. Frank Valentini came up to me one day and he said, hey, how would you like to work with Morgan Fairchild? And I was like, what? Morgan Fair? I mean, you know, this is like my youth. This is like all the shows I watched when I was a kid. Knott's Landing, you know, Flamingo yeah. Road, you know. Uh, I mean, it, it, Ted Shackelford on, on uh, The Young and the Restless. I mean, he, and, and, and some of the people that I never, you know, got to direct, uh, you know, um, I, but, but got to observe, you know. It's it, it, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing um, genre. And, and yes, I've, I've got to work with really great people. And, and I and now, you know, I've been on General Hospital for 15 years, which I, I found that hard to believe because I thought that I had spent a lot of time working on different shows and had only recently come to GH. But, um, you know, the cast of GH, I mean, I think you say this about every show you work on, like, oh, this is the best crew. This is the best cast. And I obviously have a, a really soft spot for Guiding Light because it was it was my 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 upbringing, mm -hmm. and and going to Passions was the best show ever, ever. You know the the special effects, the, the little we were the little show that could, but you know GH it it has to be said, and and I agree with people when they say it now. This is the best cast. This is the best crew. We are the best crew. You know. I mean, you know, Frank Valentini, he, 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 it bring, he hires great people. He's a talented man. I worked with him on One Life to Live when he was a director and I was an associate director. And he was also someone who, I, who had a really beautiful visual eye. Now, the thing that people don't know about Frank Valentini is he's, an, he's a world traveler and an incredible photographer. He could publish a photography book that would make people go, this is an extraordinarily talented photographer. So not only is he, is he like a director producer, you know, and of course he has to wrangle the writers, but you know, he's, he's like a, a, a Renaissance man. So I really wanted to shout out Frank because he's been incredibly supportive of me at general hospital. Now, when he came to general hospital, he said to the directors, I want you to astound and amaze me with every show that you direct. And when he came to the show, I was not necessarily top of the pecking order. I was, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a passable director, but I was like, okay, you want astounding, you want amazement, I will amaze you. And I started to really like try to think out of the box. By that point in time, I think I had won over the cast, they trusted me. So I started doing things that I had never, you know, I, 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 I kind of went against the keep it simple modality and started really trying to do different things. We also had this new lighting director who came to General Hospital from One Life to Live um, and uh, Bob, Bob Bessoir, Bobby Bessoir. And he brought with him an artifact from the city. And this artifact from the city soap opera was called the Morgan Ball. And what the Morgan Ball was, was a pole upon which was a, a ball that had a light in it, an LED light. And you would hold it under Morgan Fairchild to make her look beautiful. And she was very interested in her lighting when she was on the city and, and as any professional person should be. She took great care in, in her appearance and what she looked like. And she understood that she looked better in certain lighting and she asked for what she wanted and they devised this thing, the Morgan ball. So now on general hospital, we use lighting panels, which means that we can light people and make them look beautiful in places that are hard to light. Like if guiding light had had a Morgan ball, when they went to PPAC and when they went to like shooting in the restrooms of TV, uh, the broadcast center, they would have looked a lot nicer. I was not a huge fan. I was a, a fan of the ambition of what the last two years of Guiding Light were like, 
but I think it was an idea whose time came too soon. Understood. But it, it, it preserved Guiding Light for two more years. And, and who doesn't love yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Annie was asking, can you talk about some of your favorite stories and characters who you directed on Sunset Beach? Yeah, well, her name is Annie. So who who, who is a favorite character on Sunset Beach? But Annie, <laughs> I mean, you know, I got to direct this, um, what, what we call a... Um, you know, like, uh, I, 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 let me put it a different way from how I put it at the time. We have a character on General Hospital called The Bridge. So this was like a bridge fight between Meg and Annie on um, Sunset Beach. It was like in the, it was like episode 15 or something. And, and I think Annie had all of this like glassware out in her house and she had done something awful to Meg and Meg comes over and then they end up with like Meg breaking bottles on the floor and then she, Annie launches into her and they get to a fight through, through the living room and they end up out in the jacuzzi together, pawing at each other, shouting at each other. And we obviously had to do it in one take because, you know, there was all this glass being broken and they had it ended up wet at the end. And that was one of my favorite things. I, of course, loved working with Terry Davis from Edge of Night who was a guest star on Sunset Beach during a crazy storyline in which people were, they got close to some jewels that were cursed and they all like aged when they got too close to the jewels. And Michael Sabatino was part of that storyline. And the rumor had it that that storyline was going to turn out that he was a vampire and we were going to go into a supernatural story. But then NBC was readying passions at the time so they said no, they did not want Sunset Beach to get into any supernatural elements. I also liked obviously working with Leslie Ann Down. You know, she's a legend. I, I had watched her on Upstairs Downstairs in a British television show. She was class itself. Kathleen Noon, Gordon Thompson, you know, Dynasty fan Dynasty. here. Yeah. Uh, and of course, he was Mason on Santa Barbara. Um, favorite storylines? I mean, you know, um, I loved Terror Island when when uh, we, evil Ben, you know, his brother Clive was menacing and he kept Ben captive in like a, a room with two way mirror. That was a lot of fun stuff to do. I like the I liked when we did the Jerry Springer show and like it was um, Leslie Ann down on the Jerry Springer show. We had this huge monitor. So we, we were able to have cameras shooting the cast and cameras shooting the stage. And unfortunately, my, my associate director, Ian Toporoff, on the day, I was like, you have to figure out the, the what's going on in the monitor screen because I can't do it all at once. So he kept, he kept like the monitor screen filled with what we called the undercut. Uh, recently, I got to do that again on General Hospital when Morgan Fairchild was on the show and we had this behind the scenes, you know, on, on a, on a uh, home shopping network show. And I was able to sort of have a monitor that could have the undercut of what cameras were shooting on the stage while we saw the characters backstage. And, and unfortunately the technical director was like, Fido, what do you mean with this undercut? Cause I had, you know, I had split the, the page in half and I had cameras on one side that were gonna be what we were shooting that was gonna be on TV. And then what we were shooting that was gonna be in the undercut that would be on the monitor screen. But yeah, that, that Sunset Beach was a really fun show. Had a lot of humor. We, we were, uh, you know, we had a, it, it, it was a different kind of a show. I, I got to work with a lot of great people, um, really great cast. A lot of those camera people work with me now. Uh, Dean Casanella, one of the camera people, he, he gave me my nickname, which is PX1 or Fido Xavier the first because I <laughs> changed my name while I was on that show. So I had to tell everyone, I had to go in one day and say, hey everyone, I'm no longer Scott. I'm now gonna be called Fido or Fido. So what prompted you to change your name? Well, I am a musician and I, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, when I was 13, I came up with this pseudonym for my musical name because I, I wanted a name that was dramatic and glamorous that could be kind of like a David Bowie like name. And so I came up with Fido Xavier, Fido Xavier, because it looked very exotic. And I was in a, a, a punk rock band called Sally Dick and Jane. And because my name was Scott, that my nickname was Spot, which was a dog's name. So I wanted, and I was making tapes where I was playing all the instruments. So I had this phony faux band of Scott Riggs, 
Spot, Parry, and Fido Xavier. And eventually I just started making music under Fido Xavier. And all my musician friends, when they would meet me as Fido, if they met a friend from a different part of my life who knew me as Scott, <laughs> They would be like, oh, I'm not going to call you this stupid Fido name. I'm going to I'm going to call you your real name. So I just kind of felt like it was a um, it was an opportunity for me to become who I really wanted to be and uh, and just change my 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 earthly destiny. I, and, I love uh, that you, you picked it out early, though. You had it. I for did. Time. Yeah, that, I did. That, so that's incredible. For better or worse. You know, I mean, it's fun, you know, because people come into the show and they see my name on the script and it looks really exotic and, and very, you know, um, uh, almost elegant. And then they meet me and they're like, oh, what's your, I'm like Fido. And they're like, oh, you know, some people call me Fido. They're, you know, they're like, I, I think I'll call you Fido. It's, it's both, people call me both. You know? Yeah, I, I, sorry, I mispronounced. Um, That's okay. Another fan, It's Grant's Rant says, he has always looked up to you and would love to hear about your experience directing the Passions Disaster, assuming you directed those. Um, but he loved that show as well and, and has always looked up to you. Passions was amazing. I did not get to direct the, um, the uh, tidal wave that capsized the boat at, uh, early on, but I did get to direct, to direct the tsunami that came and, and, and leveled the town where all the, everyone kept you know, getting swept away in their front, front yards. Uh, and we we work we we put up a giant swimming pool in what used to be the Seinfeld uh, studio on CBS oh, Radford wow. lot, and we put up all the sets in this swimming pool, and before there was water, and then we had the actors in front of the sets. They would leave the set. Oh, I think I um, I froze again. You did. Do you, do yeah. you want me to log, log yeah. back on? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. See you in a minute. These stories are incredible. I hope everyone's enjoying. Um, he has worked on a lot of soap opera, <laughs> a lot of episodes in his career. There you go. We're having a, a, a rainstorm out here in California, which, which they call atmospheric river floating above us. So I think the internet might be a little spotty at times. Yeah, you're but, having a cyclone, a bomb cyclone. Speaking of water dumps, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what we did on, on the day where we shot everybody coming out their front doors as the tsunami hit was we, we, we would leave the real studio where the set was and have them come out onto the swimming pool set and dump huge dumps of water onto stunt people that um, were in, in this setting. And uh, one of those dumps resulted in the set falling down which gave me a, um, a, a mention on uh, Extra, that, that, that Hollywood um, story uh, broadcast one day, you know, Hollywood set collapses during stunt gone wrong. Oh, and uh, luckily no one was hurt. And then we had the whole swimming pool full of water with sets set up around it, where I had to have Aunt Bet skiing, water skiing. Um, and at one point, uh, I can't remember what characters they were. They got catapulted into, they, they, they touched a live wire and then they got catapulted into a, 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 a super, I mean, like a, um, a store, like a Macy's like store. I can't remember what those characters were, but a lot of people were floating around for, for a couple of days. I shot that and Peter Brinkerhoff shot it. Peter, Brin I was a little, um, I think I did the first day. Peter and I shared the very first day where the water dumps happened. And then I did the first full day and we had a little problem with our underwater camera and so i kind of in order to save time forget forgot about using the underwater camera and when i watched peter's show he waited for the water camera and his show looked a lot nicer with the water camera so that's a regret on on my uh on my uh that'll be that'll be on my tombstone um <laughs> but then i also got to direct the scenes where julian crane fell into the tuna vat what, like, I think he was like, he climbed up, you know, and then was hanging over the tuna vat. And I think someone shot him and he, or he, he fell into the tuna vat. Only, only in daytime. Only in daytime. And then he was apparently turned into tuna that Tabitha opened the can and fed it to her cats. Later on, we realized he hadn't actually died in the tuna vat. 
but we thought he had. Um, what other disasters on, on passions were there? I mean, I got to do so many green screen things, Tabitha giving birth, Tabitha and Julian um, uh, romping, having, having their uh, one night affair in her bedroom with multiple jungle animals. I think there were, um, I, I got to work with Robin Strasser playing the witch Hecuba on Passions. Now I worked with Robin, not as a director, but as, as an AD on One Life to Live. And when I got to One Life to Live as a director, or when I got to direct on One Life to Live, you know, as a guest director after Sunset Beach, she was not on there because Jill Phelps, who brought me, Jill Phelps basically gave me a lot of my career because she gave me my first job at One Life, I mean, at Guiding Light as a director. Then she brought me over to Another World. And then she brought me over to One Life to Live when I left Sunset Beach. And then she brought me to General Hospital after Passions was canceled. And uh, she did not bring me to The Young and the Restless, but, um, or, or um, what was that show? Uh, Hollywood Heights, sadly. I would have liked to have worked on Hollywood Heights. But, Do you um, remember your first show you directed at Guiding Light? Oh yes, absolutely. It was, it was not a show, it was three scenes and they were at the diner and the very first scene was that Alan Michael, Rick Hurst, comes in and he goes to sit at the counter to talk to Eleni, Eleni number two, played by Jennifer Roselle. Yeah. And then uh, Jean Carroll comes in and she and Alan Michael went to sit at the, at the, um, at the uh, what do you call it, the banquet or, or, or mm -hmm. like the yes, downstage yeah. center. Yeah. So I got, so I worked with those three. Rick Hurst, I, I, you know, was, I loved him as Alan Michael. I got to work with him, of course, as a director on, on General Hospital. He's a great guy, but he, you know, he, couldn't, he couldn't ask for nice people. He birthday yesterday, I think, or the day before. Oh, nice. And then my second group of scenes at Guiding Light was I was, I was sort of shadowing Bruce Barry. I was splitting a day with him. And they were scenes, again, with Jennifer Roselle and Frank Dacopoulos. And they were a love scene. So I got to direct my, my second day of directing was a love scene, you know, tilt pan to the camera, dissolve to the flame, you know, hands going up the shoulders, you know, looks, look number one, look number two, go to the kiss, look number three, come from the kiss, look again, you know, fall to the bed, looking artfully directed, you know, you know, cut to the, the shimmering uh, fabric yeah. as we dissolve <laughs> to them. And now they're naked under the covers. Um, I, I want to ask you this before we go, because a fan asked me this last week and I don't have the answer. And, and I don't know that you will, um, because I do think it's all basically dollars and cents. But the fan was basically saying, what do you think the four remaining shows need to do to keep the genre alive? And how how do you feel personally about the soap genre today? Well, I love the soap genre. I love the soap genre of today. I think it. I think it moves quickly. I think we have to focus on telling stories that um, you know are about today, that are that are a wide mm -hmm. variety of people, a wide variety of you know. We can't, even though we love our our elder statesmen on the show, we can't lose sight of bringing new characters on. We can't lose sight of of the people that we love. We can't lose sight of the grandmothers and the grandfathers. You know they. You know, the, the uniqueness of a soap opera is that it tells a story about family and community. And in our world today, we're, we're so often, you know, just all doing our own thing and we lose sight of family and community. And I think that people, you know, a lot of these shows were passed down from mother to daughter to son, you know, mother to daughter and son, you know, cousin to cousin. I mean, they're, fa they're shows that have a history and, and I think they're useful for that. We also we also are useful for the the um, the the networks because this is a this is an hour of airtime every day in a well oiled machine that you could tell any story that you want you could you could put on I mean you, we can do anything you want we did a Christmas Carol a couple of years ago on General Hospital that I mean every everyone the costume design the actors the makeup everyone just they went to their creativity. You know, we used to just go to town on passions. We would have these like fantasies where it was just an opportunity, the wigs, the, the costumes, the settings, 
you know, of course, nowadays we don't have as much money to spend, but I think, you know, tell a, a good story um, and, and tell it with style and, you know, swiftly and with style, to, to quote a character from the sitcom Allo Allo, uh, which I love, a British sitcom, Watch, check it out. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think the, 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 what I loved, I love television because I love something that I can, that I can come back to again and again. Films are great. There are a lot of amazing films that you watch once and they change your life. And I know there's sequels a lot these days, but watching a television show where you see the same group of Charlie's angels and they're going to find their, they're going to solve a crime this week, you know, or, or you tune into, you know, South Fork. You, you, you got me at angel. You got me at angel. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, so a soap opera where every day, you get to spend time with people that you know. And the thing about acting and actors on soap operas is that they're acting very subtle, small beats that, you know, when you're, when you're doing like a nighttime soap or, or a, a, a 12 part series, you know, the scenes are quick, they transmit something, but you could say our scenes are slow and that we do a lot of repeat, you know, dialogue exposition, but we also get to get into little wrinkles and explore things that I think people don't, often get to explore. So I love the genre. I'm, I'm a defender of it. You know, I, I've never been one who's like, well, if I could only use this as a springboard to work in sitcoms or work in, you know, a, a more qualified nighttime show, you know, I mean, our, it is true. Our shows do not have titles. They have episode numbers. I think the last episode I directed was 15,123, you know, that, that was that was Brit's uh, birthday party episode fifteen thousand one hundred and twenty three. Um, so, or, or maybe it was one twenty eight. I can't remember. Well, what you are able to direct, you know, in a day is an incredible amount. No, no primetime show would live up to that. And and we can only do it because our crew, our crew know how to do it, and they follow. The breadcrumbs and they follow the journey and if you if you have if you can you know treat your crew with the reverence that they deserve that they'll go anywhere with you you know and as you can see from my display behind me you know i i, I th there's a great history to all these shows you know when you think about guiding lights 70 years you know general hospital is yeah. now 60 this is gh60 Coincidentally, uh, I, I was looking to see if any of the fans watching us today noticed the books behind you. I don't think they, um, I'm not 100% sure I saw anybody write about the books behind your head. Well, <laughs> you, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I watch a lot of your, your, uh, your locker rooms and oh, I don't necessarily thanks, know to watch them live, but I've watched a lot of great ones. And, uh, you know, so, th so these sh the great thing about this is that these shows get watched again and again. You know, I mean, yeah. I watched one with with As the World Turns, who did where I got to see Maura West and Michael Park. I, I, I love the one with John James, hearing stories about him on, uh, you know, yeah, As the World Turns. You know, the passions, re the reunions you were doing during lockdown, the locker yeah. down, you know. So mm -hmm. so thank you for having me on. I was well, gutted. I, I was so sad. I was so yeah, sad that I didn't get to participate. Other. Yeah. I mean, because I would have got to I, see Bruce. That's I mean, true. Three I people I love. Sonia, yeah. Bruce, and Scott. But but this, I think the fans got a lot more out, out of you than they would have back then. Um, wait, you, you said something else and I was gonna, I forgot what you said. Oh, I at the end of the month, I have your old Sunset Beach, uh, Lisa Guerrero, who I adore. Oh, I love her. I Please give her my regards. Right. She is an incredible... What I, I read her memoir, her life story is something. Wow. Yeah. What an incredible lady. She, incredible lady. She got a lot Scott, of uh, flack. Come back and let's talk music another time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's one other, there was one final thing I wanted to say. What was it? I can't remember what it was. Oh, no. Uh, I just wanted to say it's a, it's GH60. GH was born April 1st, 1963, which is kind of funny because I was born January 14th. 1963. So this is Fido 60 and GH 60. I always know where I'm at 
with my age well, because that, of where that's, age around, and... that's around the third anniversary of this show. I'm going to reach out to Marianne Price and see what we can do. That would be, there you go. Would be fun. You stay well, my friend. Great to see you. Thank you for spending the hour. Absolutely. Talk to you later. Bye, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Thank you to Fredo for joining us. Tune into General Hospital weekdays on ABC at 3 p.m. Eastern. Please join me tomorrow when Emmy Award winner John Wesley Ship joins me live. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if, and if you want to stream an audio version of The Locker Room, just search The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. Have a great evening, everybody, and I will see you tomorrow afternoon.